A very good evening aspirants, I welcome you all to the Hindu daily news analysis brought to you by Shankar AS Academy. Today I am going to cover important news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 1st of August 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we will be discussing today. And a kind request to you all, those who have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, do subscribe and hit the bell icon button so that you will get regular notifications about our current affairs videos. Now let us get into our first news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article. This news article says that till date a total of 75.51 lakh houses have been constructed under Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Urban. In that Uttar Pradesh has the highest number of completed houses. The news article further says that the central government has released additional assistance to the state governments under Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Urban Scheme. And this is all about the news. In this context, let us discuss about Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Urban. Now first, let us understand about Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana in general and then we will focus on Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Urban. The Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, which is in short called as PMAY, was launched by the Government of India on June 1, 2015. The PMAY is a flagship housing project that aims to provide affordable housing for all by the year 2022. As COVID interrupted the progress of the scheme, in August 2022, the Union Cabinet approved the continuation of Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana up to the year 2024. Basically, the PMAY scheme aims to provide low-cost paka houses to the poor in both urban and rural areas. Apart from houses, the scheme also aims to provide basic amenities such as water supply, proper sanitation and electricity. A note on important point here, for administrative convenience, Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana is divided into two components, such as Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Urban and Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Gramin. See, PMAOI Gramin and PMAOI Urban may be two separate schemes, but they serve a common purpose of providing affordable houses to the poor people. Okay, the primary reason for the bifurcation of PMAOI is that it is to ensure complete attention on the scheme by the local authorities. And the bifurcation will also help the local authorities to concentrate on their respective regions. Okay, and note that PMAOI Urban is implemented by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, whereas PMAOI Gramin is implemented by the Ministry of Rural Development. Okay, this is all about Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana in general. As the news article mentioned about Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Urban, now we will understand more about PMAOI Urban. See, PMAOI Urban Scheme aims to provide low-cost affordable houses to the poor urban people. The main objective of the PMAOI Urban is to build 2 crore houses for urban poor including economically weaker sections and low-income groups. See, PMAOI Urban has 4 components. Now we will look at the components one by one. The first component is Credit Linked Subsidy Scheme. This component provides interest subsidy to eligible beneficiaries who take a loan to build or buy a house. The second component is Inside to Slum Development. As the name suggests, this component aims to redevelop slums in urban in a planned manner. Then the third component is Beneficiary Led Construction. Under this component, beneficiaries can build their own houses with government assistance. And the final component is affordable rental housing. This component aims to provide affordable rental housing to the urban poor. Okay, so these are the four components under PMAY Urban. Now moving on to see about the funding pattern of Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Urban. See the Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Urban is a centrally sponsored scheme. This means that the central government provides financial assistance to state governments to implement PMAY Urban. But note that the component of credit linked subsidy is being implemented as a central sector scheme. That is, the center provides full assistance to the component of credit linked subsidy under the Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Urban. Okay, this is all about the funding pattern. Now let us see some of the benefits of Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Urban. See, all houses under the PMAY Urban have basic amenities like toilets, 
water supply, electricity and kitchen. The minimum size of houses constructed under PMAY Urban conforms to the standards provided in National Building Code. Okay. See, the Pradhana Mantri Awas Yojana Urban Mission promotes women empowerment by providing the ownership of houses in the name of female members or in joint name. Apart from this, preference is also given to differently abled persons, senior citizens, SCs, STs, OBCs, minority, single women, transgender and other weaker and vulnerable sections of the society. Okay. Under the scheme, eligible beneficiaries can get an interest subsidy of up to 6.5% on home loans taken for building or buying a house. Okay. Overall, Pradhan Mantri Awa Sojana Urban is a significant government initiative that aims to provide affordable houses to the urban poor. The scheme has made significant progress in recent years and it is expected to help millions of people to achieve their dream of owning a home. Okay. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana in general. And then we saw some points about Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Urban. See, this topic is very much important for your prelims. You can also use these points in your main sensor. Okay. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now, take a look at this editorial article here. This editorial article is speaking about India's clean cooking strategy. This editorial focuses on various aspects like factors that led to increase in LPG adoption, then the reason for current decline in LPG consumption and finally the steps that can be taken to make India's clean cooking energy strategy a successful one. So in our discussion today we will understand these points mentioned in the editorial. Now let us start our discussion by getting a brief idea about India's clean cooking strategy or clean cooking energy roadmap. See India's clean cooking strategy is the outcome of a collaboration between CEEW, GIS and Niti Aayog. Here CEEW that is the Council on Energy, Environment and Water is a non-profit organization that work towards building a sustainable India. Then GIS is a German based development agency that is working towards international cooperation for sustainable development. And Niti Aayog is a Indian think tank that provides policy advices to the government. So India's clean cooking strategy is the outcome of a collaboration between these three bodies. Okay. Now coming to the clean cooking strategy of India, see the main aim of the clean cooking energy strategy of India is to eliminate the use of all cooking arrangements that cause household air pollution in India by 2025. The strategy adopts a multi-fuel, multi-stakeholder approach and it is guided by the principles of equity and inclusion. The clean cooking energy roadmap focuses on both the supply side and the demand side to ensure the use of clean cooking energy. On the supply side, the focus is on access to improved cookstoves, biogas, LPG, piped natural gas, solar and electricity based cooking. And on the demand side, it focuses on ensuring clean cooking energy that is affordable and it also focuses on enhancing the awareness of households about the adverse health effects of household air pollution. Okay. See the clean cooking energy strategy is based on area based approach. This is because only an area based approach will yield long lasting results in a diverse country like India. For example, in rural areas with an adequate cattle population, the focus should be on complementing LPG with biogas. Then in areas with adequate sunlight, solar powered cooking can be one of the solutions. And in areas with abundant biomass, improved cookstoves could complement LPG. Okay. Like this, an area based approach will be developed for every area by looking at both the supply side and demand side. Okay. This is how the clean cooking energy strategy plans to make India household air pollution free by 2025. Now having done with the basics, now let us look at India's LPG story. In this, first let us see the steps taken by India to increase LPG use for cooking in India. Here two government programs played important roles. The first one is Gramin Vitrak Yojana. This particular scheme was launched in 2009. This scheme aims at setting up small size LPG distribution agencies. 
these small size LPG distribution agencies help to increase rural LPG penetration and it also covers remote areas as well as low potential areas. See this particular scheme helped to grow the rural distributor base from 18 percentage to 60 percentage. Then the second scheme is Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana. The primary objective of this scheme is to provide clean cooking fuel particularly liquefied petroleum gas that is LPG. See the LPG is provided to women who are from economically disadvantaged households. Under the Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana, eligible beneficiaries are provided with financial assistance to purchase a new LPG connection which includes the cost of the gas cylinder, regulator and initial administrative charges. Additionally, all Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana beneficiaries will be provided with first LPG refill and stove both free of cost. Okay. See the Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana has provided more than 9.5 crore new households with LPG connections since 2016. See both the Gramin Vitrak Yojana and Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana increased the penetration of LPG in India and also reduced rural urban divide in LPG coverage. For example, according to India Residential Energy Consumption Survey which was conducted by the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, the share of Indian households using LPG as the primary cooking fuel has risen to about 71% in 2020 from 33% in 2011. So year on year, the LPG consumptions by households in India kept on increasing. But recently this positive trend has been reversed. See, for the first time, LPG consumption in Indian households saw an absolute reduction in financial year 2023. That is, the consumption was reduced to minus 0.5 percentage when compared with financial year 2022. This was witnessed after years of steady growth. Okay. Now, what are the reasons that led to the decrease in LPG connection by the households? The first and foremost reason is COVID induced lockdown and the associated livelihood losses. This resulted in reduction in household income level. So some people didn't able to refill LPG. Then the second reason is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. See the Russian invasion of Ukraine resulted in volatility of LPG prices. See compared to May 2020, now the price of LPG has nearly doubled. This also led to decrease in LPG consumption in India. Then the last reason is withdrawal of government support. In 2020, with the onset of COVID-19, the subsidy for LPG connection was withdrawn for all consumers. Okay, so this also led to decrease in LPG consumption. See, all these three reasons have made LPG use unaffordable. That is mainly for the poorer section of the people. So this has led to decline in LPG consumption by the households. To reverse this negative trend, the government took some efforts. For example, in financial year 2021, three free cylinders were provided to all Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana consumers as part of the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Yojana. Then from 2022, the government started providing a nominal subsidy of rupees 200 per cylinder for Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana consumers. Both these efforts have resulted in some positive effects, but the results were not significant. And in addition to this, we cannot expect the government to subsidize LPG cylinders for a long time as it is unsustainable. Okay, now what is the solution? Then what can be done to Indian households to adopt clean cooking strategy and reduce household air pollution? See, the solution lies in moving from LPG only strategy to focusing on all clean energy solutions. The most cost effective alternative to LPG is electricity based cooking. See, our rural areas have almost 100% electricity coverage. So adoption of electricity based cooking won't be a problem. In addition to this, electricity based cooking is also a cheaper one when compared to LPG based cooking. For example, a study conducted by the Council on Energy, Environment and Water shows that even at a high tariff of rupees 8 for each unit of electricity, electricity cooking would still be cheaper than cooking using LPG at today's prices. So basically, the electricity based cooking is cheaper than LPG based cooking. So in essence, electricity based cooking is both available and affordable. So the government should take some steps to adopt electricity based cooking through conducive policy. Here the editorial suggests 
telescopically increasing LPG prices beyond a threshold. For example, the government can fix a threshold at 7 cylinders per year. Currently, the cost of a 14.2 kg cylinder is about 1200. The first 7 cylinders for each household would be provided at 1200. After that, the price will increase exponentially. That is, the 8th cylinder will cost Rs. 1600, then 9th cylinder at Rs. 2100, then 10th cylinder at Rs. 2800 and so on. So, this policy will limit per household consumption of LPG to 7. This in turn will push the household to switch to alternative clean cooking solutions like electricity based cooking. See, when more people start using electricity based cooking, the technology will evolve for better and prices will also come down. This will help reduce household air pollution and at the same time reduce India's dependence on imported LPG, thereby conserving our precious forex reserves. Okay, and this is the effective and sustainable solution offered by the editorial for clean cooking energy. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about what is clean cooking energy strategy. Then we saw some points about LPG connections and consumptions in India. Then we saw the reasons for recent decline in LPG consumption in India. And finally, we saw some points about the alternatives to LPG clean fuel. See, this topic is very much important for your mains exam. You can use these points while writing your mains answers. This will definitely enrich your mains answer. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now, look at this news article here. Recently, eight cheetahs that were brought from African countries have died in Kuno National Park, which is in Madhya Pradesh. The government and the National Tiger Conservation Authority says that the deaths were not due to poaching, road hits or electrocution. They believe that the deaths were due to natural causes such as low survival rates in cheetahs. See, as of now, 15 adult cheetahs and one Indian-born cheetah cub survive in the Kuno National Park. Also note that the government is planning to introduce 12 to 14 cheetahs annually from several African countries for the next five years. And this is all about this news article. As the news article mentions about the National Tiger Conservation Authority, we will look at various aspects of National Tiger Conservation Authority in detail. Now first, let us see about the establishment of National Tiger Conservation Authority. See, the National Tiger Conservation Authority, which is in short called as NTCA, was constituted under the provisions of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. As it was constituted under Parliamentary Act, the NTCA is a statutory body. See, the NTCA is functioning under the Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change. The NTCA is responsible for the conservation and management of tigers in the country. It is the implementing body of Cheetah Reintroduction Project in India. See, the NTCA was established in December 2005 following the recommendation of the Tiger Task Force. The Tiger Task Force was constituted by the Indian government to assess the status of tigers and to suggest measures for their conservation. So, based on the recommendations of the Tiger Task Force in 2005, the Wildlife Protection Act 1972 was amended to create the National Tiger Conservation Authority. Okay. Now, moving on to see about the objectives of NTCA. See, the primary objective of the NTCA is to ensure the implementation of Project Tiger program effectively. See, the Project Tiger was launched in 1973 and it was a significant initiative that aimed at conserving the declining population of tigers in India. Okay. So, the primary objective of NTCA is to ensure the implementation of Project Tiger effectively. Okay. Now, let us move on to see about the organizational structure of NTCA. The NTCA consists of a chairperson, a vice chairperson and other members. See, the Union Minister of Environment, Forests and Climate Change acts as the chairperson. Then, the Minister of State in the Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change acts as the vice chairperson of the NTCA. Also note that the NTCA consists of three members from the parliament. See, the NTCA also has a governing board. The board consists of representatives from the central government, state governments and several non-governmental organizations. Okay. And note that the NTCA is headquartered in New Delhi. And it also has regional offices in Bengaluru, Gauhati and Nagpur. 
okay this is about the organizational structure of ntca now let us see about the jurisdictions of ntca the national tiger conservation authority has jurisdiction over all tiger reserves in india it is responsible for the overall management of tiger reserves including the protection of tigers their habitat and their prey the ntca also has jurisdiction over the translocation of tigers between the tiger reserves apart from this the ntca also works with various state governments to address the threat to tigers such as poaching habitat loss and human tiger conflict okay this is all about the jurisdiction of ntca now we shall see about the powers and functions of ntca the first and foremost function of ntca is to advise the central government on all matters related to tiger conservation secondly the ntca approves the establishment of new tiger reserves and it also monitors the performance of various tiger reserves in india thirdly the ntca provides financial assistance to tiger reserves in india fourthly the ntca promotes research on tigers and their habitats and finally the ntca works to address threats to tigers such as poaching habitat loss and human tiger conflict okay to sum it up the national tiger conservation authority has been instrumental in the success of project tiger see the project tiger has helped the government to increase the tiger population in india by over 300 percentage since 1973 note that the national tiger conservation authority releases all india tiger estimation report which shows the tiger population in india okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about ntca then about the objectives of ntca then we saw about the organizational structure of ntca and finally we saw some points about the jurisdiction powers and functions of ntca see this topic is very much important for your prelims exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion Now take a look at this front page article this news article says that the central government is going to introduce a new bill named Delhi Services Bill in the Lok Sabha This bill aims to replace the Delhi Services Ordinance See the Delhi Services Ordinance was enacted in last May It gives more power to the lieutenant governor of Delhi on the postings and transfers of all bureaucrats serving under the Delhi government. The Delhi government opposed both the ordinance and the bill. The Delhi government states that the ordinance gives too much power to the lieutenant governor which undermines the power of elected Delhi government. Okay? This is all about the news. Now in this context let us discuss about the important provisions of the Delhi Services Bill and the controversies surrounding the bill. Now first let us see the background of the bill. See recently on May 2023 the Supreme Court ruled that Delhi government has the power to control the postings and transfers of bureaucrats in Delhi. In response to this the center enacted ordinance to override Supreme Court judgment. As per the ordinance the lieutenant governor of Delhi has the final say on the postings and transfers of all bureaucrats who are serving under the Delhi government. and the center is now going to introduce delhi services bill to replace this particular ordinance okay now with this background information let us understand the highlights of delhi services bill first of all know that the delhi services bill is officially called the government of national capital territory of delhi amendment bill 2023 as per the provisions of the new bill a national capital civil services authority which is in short called nccsa will be established The NCCSA will be responsible for making recommendations on postings and transfers of bureaucrats who are serving under the Delhi government. See the bill also provides more power to the lieutenant governor of Delhi to remove any bureaucrat from their post without the approval of Delhi government. Okay? These are the two important provisions of the Delhi Services Bill. As I mentioned about National Capital Civil Services Authority, let us see some points about this particular authority. See the National Capital Civil Service Authority that is NCCSA was set up by the central government in May 2023. This is followed by the promulgation of Delhi Services Ordinance. The NCCSA is responsible for making recommendations on the postings and transfers of all Group A officers serving in Delhi. The NCCSA is chaired by the Chief Minister of Delhi. 
then other members of the authority include the chief secretary of delhi then the principal home secretary of delhi and the secretary to the government of india and the ministry of home affairs okay this is the composition now let us see some other important functions of nccsa see the nccsa advises the lieutenant governor on all matters relating to civil services in delhi apart from this the nccsa monitors the performance of civil services in the delhi government and finally the nccsa promotes the efficiency and effectiveness of civil services in delhi okay this is all about the functions of nccsa now why the delhi government is opposing the bill see the bill states that the decision of nccsa would come into force only if the lieutenant governor of delhi agrees with the decision this means that in case of disputes between nccsa and lieutenant governor the decision of lieutenant governor is final see this is the point of contention between delhi government and the central government the delhi government is arguing that the nccsa gives too much power to the lieutenant governor the delhi government also says that the nccsa is unconstitutional as it violates the principle of cooperative federalism okay see the delhi government has challenged the delhi service ordinance before the supreme court so we have to wait and see what the supreme court will rule on this matter okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about delhi services ordinance then we saw some points about delhi services bill that is going to be tabled in lok sabha okay now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this editorial article this editorial article is speaking about article 370 of the indian constitution it made news today because tomorrow that is on august 2 2023 the supreme court will begin to hear oral arguments in the case concerning article 370 Since 1949 to August 2019 Jammu and Kashmir had a special status that was granted under Article 370 and Article 35A of the Indian Constitution on August 5 2019 Article 370 was abrogated by the presidential order this ended the special status that was earlier provided to Jammu and Kashmir in addition to this the years 12 Jammu and Kashmir state was divided into two union territories such as ladakh and jammu and kashmir so four years have went past since the dissolution of article 370 as we saw earlier the supreme court will hear oral arguments regarding the dissolution of article 370 so the supreme court will attempt to determine whether the decisions made regarding article 370 are in violation of constitution or not okay This is the background of this editorial. Now, in this discussion, let us understand some of the important points provided in this editorial article. Now, before getting into discussion, the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here. You can go through it. Now, first, we shall see about the background of inclusion of Article 370 and some of its important provisions. As we all know, the Indian Independence Act 1947 established the independent dominion of India. The Act allowed to use Government of India Act 1935 as an interim constitution until India adopts its own constitution. The Independence Act also granted freedom to Indian princely states either to join the dominion of India or dominion of Pakistan or to remain independent. See most of the princely states were voluntarily joined India and some were annexed by military operations. Now if we take Jammu and Kashmir See Jammu and Kashmir was also a princely state during India's independence. At that time, the Jammu and Kashmir was ruled by Maharaja Hari Singh. He opted to remain independent. Subsequently, Pakistan tried to occupy Jammu and Kashmir by a military action. So Raja Hari Singh approached India for help and he accepted to join India with certain terms and conditions. Therefore in 1947 an instrument of accession was signed between India and Maharaja Hari Singh of Jammu and Kashmir. See one of the provisions of instrument of accession gave rise to article 370. This article 370 provided certain autonomous powers to Jammu and Kashmir state. Now let us see the powers that were provided in article 370 one by one. Firstly the article restricted the legislative power of Indian parliament over Jammu and Kashmir. See except certain matters like defense finance communication and foreign affairs the indian parliament needs the approval of government of jammu and kashmir in order to apply laws and rules in jammu and kashmir 
secondly article 370 provided for separate flag and constitution to the state of jammu and kashmir then the third important power is that the presidential rule cannot be imposed in jammu and kashmir state and only governor's rule can be proclaimed apart from this the government of india cannot declare a financial emergency under article 360 in the jammu and kashmir state and only a national emergency can be imposed in matters of external aggression or war then fourthly article 370 provided the jammu and kashmir to follow its own criminal code titled ranbir penal code then fifthly the article 370 provided dual citizenship to the citizens in the jammu and kashmir state then sixthly no persons were allowed from outside jammu and kashmir to purchase a property in jammu and kashmir and the final power is regarding the tenure of state legislature see the term of other indian state legislatures was 5 years but the special status provided 6 year term to the legislature of kashmir this is all about the provisions regarding special status that were earlier granted to jammu and kashmir even though these provisions were incorporated in the constitution of india they were made temporary see according to clause 3 of article 370 the president by public notification may declare that article 370 shall cease to be operative that is the clause 3 of article 370 provided the president a power to dissolve article 370 but to make such notification of dissolution of article 370 the president needs recommendations of the constituent assembly of jammu and kashmir state see after 1957 when jammu and kashmir's constitution came into force its constituent assembly was disbanded and it was replaced by a legislative assembly see this situation created confusions like how to repeal the act without the constitution assembly this means that there were no constituent assembly in jammu and kashmir after 1957 then how article 370 was abrogated see in 2019 there was no state legislative assembly in jammu and kashmir since the state was under president's rule So technically the governor under the parliament's directions was ruling the Jammu and Kashmir at that time. So using this as an opportunity the union government used article 367. See article 367 lays down the rules for interpretation of the constitution of India. On August 5 2019 the president's order was issued to amend article 367 with a view to transform the existing status of Jammu and Kashmir. the presidential order just added a new clause to article 367 this clause said that wherever the term constituent assembly of the state was used in article 370 it would be replaced with legislative assembly of the state okay since the state was under president's rule the governor has to act not only as the state legislative assembly but also its constituent assembly so the president with the help of governor declared that all classes of article 370 shall ceases to be operative as of august 6 2019 okay this is how article 370 was abrogated and note that a new class named article 370 class 1 was added and it states that all provisions of the constitution of india along with all amendments shall apply to the state of jammu and kashmir so as of now the jammu and kashmir is treated on par with other states okay see the changes brought by the abrogation of article 370 is displayed here you can pass the video and go through it and that's all regarding this discussion is discussion we saw about the background of inclusion of article 370 into the indian constitution then we saw about the important provisions of article 370 and finally we saw some points about how article 370 was abrogated now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this small article from the text and context page This news article says that 49 percentage of beneficiaries of Ayushman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Jan Aarogya Yojana are female. The news article further says that 141 health benefit packages under the Pradhan Mantri Jan Aarogya Yojana are exclusively year marked for women. And this is all about the news. Now in this discussion let us see some points about Ayushman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Jan Aarogya Yojana. See Ayushman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Jan Aarogya Yojana is a centrally sponsored scheme. It was launched in 2018 with an objective of universal health coverage. It is being implemented by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. The scheme consists of two components namely Ayushman Bharat scheme and National Health Protection Scheme. Now let us look at these two schemes one by one. 
Now first let us look at Ayushman Bharat scheme. See under the Ayushman Bharat scheme 1.5 lakh existing sub centers will be converted into health and wellness centers. The main motive behind this move is to bring the healthcare system closer to the homes of the people. See the health and wellness centers will provide comprehensive health care like care for non communicable diseases and maternal and child health services. Okay, this is all about Ayushman Bharat scheme. Now let us look at the National Health Protection Scheme under Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana. The main aim of the National Health Protection Scheme is to provide a defined benefit cover of rupees 5 lakh per family per year. This cover will take care of almost all secondary care and most of the tertiary care procedures. More importantly, to ensure that nobody is left out, that is especially women, children and elderly, there will be no cap on family size and age in the National Health Protection Scheme. And note that the benefit cover will also include pre and post hospitalization expenses. Apart from this, a defined transport allowance for hospitalization will also be paid to the beneficiary under the National Health Protection Scheme. Also remember that the benefits of the scheme are portable across the country. Apart from this, a beneficiary covered under the scheme will be allowed to take cashless benefits from any public or private empaneled hospitals across the country. Okay, I have displayed the eligibility criteria and exclusion criteria. You can pause the video and go through it. See, under the Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana, the government had also announced that the COVID expenses of children will also be covered under Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana. That is, every family with a child was eligible to get a cover of rupees 5 lakh for the COVID treatment of the child. Okay. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion is about Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana in detail. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion. That is to discuss preliminary practice questions. Now, look at the first question. This first question is regarding National Tiger Conservation Authority. Here, three statements are given. We have to identify how many of the statements are correct. Now, look at the first statement. It was established under the provisions of Environment Protection Act 1980. See, this statement is wrong. The NTCA was established under the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 and it is a statutory body. So, statement 1 is wrong. Now, coming to the second statement, it was established in 2005 based on the recommendations of Tiger Task Force. See, this statement is correct as we saw in the discussion. The National Tiger Conservation Authority was established in 2005 based on the recommendations of Tiger Task Force. Now, coming to the third statement, the Prime Minister of India acts as the chairperson of the NTCA. See, this statement is wrong. As we saw in the discussion, the Union Minister of Environment, Forests and Climate Change acts as the chairperson of NTCA. So, third statement is incorrect. Here, only second statement alone is correct. So, the correct answer for the question is option A only one. Moving on, let's take up the second question. This question is regarding Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana Urban. Look at the first statement. All the components of this scheme is implemented as central sector scheme. See, this statement is wrong. As we saw in the discussion, the Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana consists of four different components. In that, the component of credit linked subsidy is implemented as a central sector scheme. But other components are implemented as centrally sponsored scheme. So, first statement is incorrect. Now, coming to the second statement, the mission covers the entire urban area consisting of statutory towns and notified planning areas. See, this statement is correct. The Pradhan Mantri Ava Sevjana Urban covers the entire urban area consisting of statutory towns and notified planning areas. Now, coming to the third statement, under the scheme, the beneficiaries can build their own houses with government assistance. See, this statement is correct. Under the component of beneficiary-led construction of Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana Urban, the beneficiaries can build their own houses with government assistance. So, third statement is correct. Of the given three statements, first statement alone is incorrect. So, the correct answer is option B, only two. This is the quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in the community section. Try to answer it. And the answer for the quiz question is posted on the comment section of the quiz question itself. You can verify the answers. And displayed here are the main questions for your practice. Go through the questions, write your answers and post it in the comment section. 
with this we have come to the end of the discussion if you found our video to be useful do like comment and share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to shankarayas academy youtube channel thank you for listening